The tape recordings you are about to hear were recorded in undisclosed locations more than 20 years ago. They were made on an old microcassette recorder and have never been played publicly before. Some of the things that are said may be both difficult to understand due to the quality of the tapes and troubling to hear due to content. Listener discretion is advised. We began this show with the sounds of Ireland. And it's fitting that we end with the sounds of Northern Ireland today. The hustle and bustle of a major city. Because Belfast is a bustling metropolis filled with people going about their daily routines, living in relative peace. Last summer, I took a trip with my family to Ireland. We traveled around the Republic and the North. I wandered into a pub with my oldest sons and had a pint while listening to a local band called Roving Out. I emailed the band to ask if I could use the recording, and their fiddle player, Kevin Moutsley, responded. He even sent me another track they wrote called The Other Side of Town, about a divided Belfast. I heard a story from the other side of town. It's a song about a community preoccupied with its divisions. But the once violent divisions seem more and more like the past. In fact, one of the most striking places I visited was Victoria Square Mall. If you remember Marissa McGlinchey from the first episode, she's a professor of political science and author of a book about modern day dissident Republicans. She's the one who told me to visit Victoria Square Mall because she said it's a sign how much Belfast has changed. Oh, definitely, definitely changed. I mean, uh, one of the big things that I remember um, really I thought was quite remarkable was whenever the new shopping centre was built uh, in Belfast called Victoria Square and it has a a glass roof. Um, And I remember at the time a lot of us talking about how changed times were that they would put a glass roof on a shopping centre in Belfast. And I mean, that was really... I think that spoke volumes about changed times. It's literally an investment in the peace that formed after the Good Friday Agreement. The town that was racked with violence from the 1960s to the late 1990s would never have played host to such a delightful construction. It surely would have been shattered from repeated bomb blasts. Even when I was there in 2000 during Protestant marching season, the North felt like it was on the brink of resuming war. But less than a decade later, this glass dome mall was built and has stood since. Today, Belfast is different. The city of Belfast, it is completely different and tourism now is a really big thing. Um, And so, you know, you, you get a lot of tourism and you have the Titanic Quarter you have the Game of Thrones stuff now. And, and so it really is, um, there is a vibrancy around tourism. Um, and there's a lot of political tourism as well, which of course, you know, you would, you would get some uh, dissident Republicans actually feeling quite uncomfortable about that because, you know, Sinn Féin might be selling something with Bobby Sands' face on it or, you know, and, and um, some people will criticise that as, as a bit in bad taste. But um, so it's, it's all very interesting, but it is part of the story of a, of a really changing city. And it, it has moved on a lot. And, you know, when we talk about the support for armed actions, I mean, I think that's one of the biggest problems that the dissident groups have is that the support for armed actions just isn't there. The support for armed action isn't there. Irish court reporter Dermid McDermott covered Mickey McEvitt's trial and countless others. Oh, Northern Ireland is totally... Uh... There, there is no comparison between what Northern Ireland is like now and, and what it was like uh, way back in the, the 70s, the 80s and the 90s, uh, uh, or, or what uh, uh, Michael McKevitt was trying to bring it back to. Uh, no, Northern Ireland is, is a peaceful place now. It's, it's, it's actually, it's a very beautiful part of Ireland. Dave Rupert's undercover operation and testimony at Mickey McKevitt's trial reflected the entire island's decreasing tolerance for militancy. There's just no space, no oxygen for Irish Republicanism anymore. I'm Bob Hergeth. I'm Abdin Palish. In partnership with Entropy Media, this is the final episode of Underbelly, The Rebel Kind. You 
can't uh, put a ballot paper on the table and then have an arm light rifle under the table. And they really see themselves as just the latest phase in a long line of um, fighting, you know, British rule in Ireland. Personally, I don't think I'll see it in my lifetime. But I'd love to see it, but I don't think it, it will happen. And I hope and pray to God he's living and he has a very peaceful life, he you know, after all what he done. When an FBI agent walked into Dave Rupert's truck stop in 1994, he never thought he'd end up where he did. Take, for example, this story, which shows how totally devoid of Irish sympathy Dave was before all of this. I remember in 1987, and I was in a intensive period of the Rupp State Medical in Syracuse, and I'd been in a coma for a week or so. And I came to on St. Patrick's Day, and they had all the bed decked out green, like gray paper and stuff, you know. I remember them writing, of course, I couldn't talk without a bed, and writing them a note to, to take the fucking green gray paper off my bed because I wasn't Irish. And it was only recently that my sister said to me, Oh, don't you remember Dad all tell us the word on St. Patrick's Day? Well, there's probably. <laughs> According to Dave, his dad even raised his kids with British sympathies, or at least with a certain antagonism towards the Irish Catholics. The color orange is associated with Ulster Protestants. It was never Dave's plan to wind up in the inner circle of the real IRA. It just kind of happened, and he said it was a lot of luck. It was funny because the boats told me at the time, listen, there's going to be a window here with this group that you can step through. Of her approach, kind of, they're going to accept your previous qualifications, but they're not going to ask too much because they need the paper. But they, you know, so they're just going to take they're going to take the the, the cow that you're riding with it. And that was just exactly the way it was. Dave isn't a violent guy. He told us he's a pacifist, but he played a convincing character. He quietly listened to people around him constantly plotting violence. But at the end of the day, as much as they said this was a new war, and we're going to do things different, it all came back to terabytes. Then we can address what they wanted to be. In the years since, journalist Sean Pagachnik says interest in militant action has continued to dissolve because Ireland has moved past it, and those who might have sympathized with militants in the past century now won't support or cover for them. There, are, there are, is a fringe of people who would love to be setting up bombs right now in opposition to the Tory government in London and the Democratic Unionist Party control of, uh, you know, government in Belfast. Um, but there's just if they if they if they relaunched serious uh, campaign of violence now, they would be incarcerated because people in their own communities would cooperate with the police, and just as importantly, in the Republic of Ireland, there would be no safe haven for them. They would be incarcerated in both parts. And in fact, they have, if you go to the prisons, it, there's a prison not that far from here, Mount Joy. Uh, there's another prison in Port Leash, uh, where Michael McEvitt was, uh, further west of here. Uh, but also the main prison, uh, McGabry in Northern Ireland. There are, there are more than 60 members of these various IRA factions in jail right now. And they aren't getting support from the public. Communities have turned away from violence and toward the future. But there are those who Marissa McGlinchey has interviewed who continue that violent campaign. As I say, people are always fascinated in the armed stuff. And, you know, um, the thing that a lot of people will ask is, given that the Provisional IRA campaign didn't get a United Ireland, why do these dissident groups feel that they're going to achieve Irish unity um, whenever their campaign is on such a smaller level and um, uh, and it's it's so low level and, and small scale? And I think... You know, what's come out with my interviews um, with these people regarding their motivations is that um, they're aware that they're not going to achieve a united Ireland anytime soon they're, through their armed actions. They know that. Um, but a big driving force for them is to disrupt normalisation here. So, you know, they if they stop their armed actions, they feel like the case will just normalise even further. Um, and they don't want that. They want to keep providing a rem reminder that Ireland is partitioned. And, and they really see themselves as just the latest phase in a long line of um, fighting, you know, British rule in Ireland. So they really position themselves like that. And also, 
Um, they are really keen to preserve something of a campaign to pass on to future generations. So as I say, they know that they're not going to succeed with this campaign, um, but they want to have a campaign um, to pass on. And also, uh, it's really important for them just to demonstrate their presence um, and that they can disrupt uh, and that they're still there. What was left of the militant factions in the 21st century have morphed into a fringe group referred to as the New IRA. The New IRA even had its own infiltrator recently, a Scottish cop turned British mole named Dennis McFadden. We've been unable to reach him for comment. He's credited with the arrests of alleged key figures and the disruption of links between violent dissidents and terrorist groups in the Middle East. But compare these numbers. In the 30 years before the Good Friday Agreement, there were 3,500 deaths from armed conflict across Ireland. In the nearly 30 years since the Good Friday Agreement, there have been fewer than 200. The Good Friday Agreement happened in large part because the provisional IRA laid down its weapons while its political wing, Sinn Féin, engaged in peace negotiations. You can't uh, put a ballot paper on the table and then have an arm light rifle under the table. That's, that's not the way to move forward. I'm with Michael Gallagher, whose son Aidan was killed 26 years ago in the single worst bombing of the Northern Ireland conflict. I, I would be the first to say that I was never a big fan of Sinn Féin, but I admire them for the courage that they took in making that move because there has been many, many lives saved on all sides. And I think that it, it was the extremists, the people who have hatred in their heart. It may not be the best arrangement in the world, but it's the best we have, and we need to work with it. And I know certain people within the, uh, there are extremists within the unionist community who are trying as hard as they can to uh, dismantle the Good Friday Agreement. But, but we must keep that agreement there because it's a common sense agreement. Well, we don't always agree with everything, but on balance, it's the best we have. That peace agreement was forged by multiple parties, including the U.S. under the Clinton administration. But Dave played a key role in preserving what was achieved. Personally, I, I, my belief is the reason he was recruited, the reason David Rupert was recruited, because the American government had made an immense uh, investment in the Northern Ireland peace process under uh, Bill Clinton, uh, President Clinton. They had invested a great deal. You know, they had Senator Mitchell as the, uh, George Mitchell as a, a special envoy to Northern Ireland, who was in many aspects, one of the architects of the Good Friday Agreement. And they wanted their own man, in my opinion, to see exactly what was happening on the ground. And uh, David Rupert was that man. It was important for Irish Americans to support the peace process rather than continue to fan the flames of an armed conflict from afar. Remember, the IRA thrived largely because of support from America and often American money. And that's long been the case. In fact, just recently we learned from Loyola University professor Andy Wilson that the Friends of Irish Freedom held a demonstration here in Chicago more than a century ago. The group, which Dave infiltrated decades later, held a rally in protest of the execution of the 1916 Easter Rising leaders. It was held in Chicago's Auditorium Theater, the same building where we record this podcast. Well, um, I'm not being disparaging here, but a lot of those people are unlike you. They have probably never been to Ireland or their parents have never been to Ireland. They think we're still, we're still traveling in a horse and cart. Ireland is a modern democracy. And uh, when you call... And, and, I know a lot about America. I have four sisters who lived in Chicago in, in, in the north side of the city. I've been to the Sixpenny and I've been to other bars, other Irish-American bars in Chicago. 
uh, and in New York. And I've seen the people coming in with the buckets uh, near closing time when people are intoxicated and, you know, this is for uh, for people who's been persecuted in Ireland. But what you're doing is, what I would say to those Irish Americans, uh, I would say you're you're given money to buy bullets and buy explosives to kill Irish people in order to send British people out of Northern Ireland. That really doesn't make a lot of sense. Michael Gallagher says he understands Irish Americans wanting to support their heritage, but it's important to support it in the right way. I think the Irish Americans have a huge contribution to make, a huge contribution if they come behind us and try and stop the violence and work out some of the issues that we need to, to work through, both America, Britain and Ireland. I think that tripartite group could make a huge difference. And I know there are good people in America, good Irish people in America who are doing the right thing, but there are other people who are absolutely deluded. And I have seen some of the documentary evidence of those people in cities like New York, Boston, Philadelphia, Chicago, uh, who are, uh, who feel they need a cause. This is a world that you don't need to go without a cause. There are plenty of causes, but please, please pick a cause that will make a difference to people's lives, not by destroying them. Gallagher and the other families of OMA victims have faced a long, difficult road trying to get justice for the bombing. No one has ever been held criminally liable for the blast. After a BBC Spotlight documentary identified those believed to be responsible, the victims' families filed a suit in civil court against them. So I'm interested in how all this will play out in that uh, civil suit, too. I, you know, you've got uh, somebody who's there. Uh, they purported uh, head of um, what I was telling me, that, hey, we're responsible. Yeah. Or we were 20 percent responsible. Well, there's Mookie uh, or William Campbell. I think Colin Murphy and I don't know the other two. Eventually, the families won their case against four men, Liam Campbell, Cullen Murphy, Seamus Daly, and Mickey McKevitt. Those four were held civilly liable for the bombing, but none of the 1.6 million pound judgment was ever paid. A long sought new inquiry into the bombing, including when and what authorities knew about the plot, is set to begin soon. In 2016, Mickey McEvitt was diagnosed with cancer. He was released from prison in order to obtain treatment. He died in 2021. The Good Friday Agreement represented the death of the old ways and the birth of a new Ireland. In that new Ireland, Dave Rupert set a precedent. Journalist Sean Pagachnik says Dave's testimony was a first of its kind. The thing that had never happened before, and I'd covered many IRA and other paramilitary trials for the guts of a decade when David Rupert came into the picture, but there'd never been anybody who actually came out and testified against an IRA commander like this before. It signaled the New Ireland's willingness to take a tough stance against the IRA. One thing we have to note is how Dave was a creation of the U.S. and British security services. His work largely saved the peace efforts of Jerry Adams and Martin McGuinness, the Sinn Féin leaders who negotiated the Good Friday Agreement. But a mole is still a mole, and they weren't about to thank him for it. Years ago, I spoke to Martin McGuinness at Smith & Walensky's Steakhouse here in Chicago. I asked him, you stuck your neck out to bring the IRA to the political table and Mickey McKevitt threatened to unravel your work. By taking McKevitt out of the picture, Rupert helped move that peace process forward. Do you give him any credit for that? No, McGinnis said. Rupert is a mole and an informant, and he couldn't give him any credit. The case was a slam dunk for Ireland's prosecution, but the groundwork was laid by the two other nations. Author Sean O'Driscoll. 
I mean, the, the whole operation Rupert cost millions, but they spent very little on it. In fact, I think one of the funniest lines in the whole trial was when David Rupert was, was you know, he, in total, he made 10 million from the FBI and MI5, 10 million dollars. And then he, he was asked during his trial, you know, what did the Irish government offer you? And he said, Jennings, the police officer offered me excellent for driving around. And that was it. I mean, that was, that was the extent of what the Irish government was offering. And yet they were the ones then who got to do this, like, you know, the biggest terrorist trial they ever had. Um, kind of, but it was kind of handed to them by the British and the Americans. Professor Andy Wilson. So it was, it was huge that for, for as far as the British government are concerned, massive. And, and, you know, very significant for the United States as well, because by that time, the United States had invested a hell of a lot of energy into Northern Ireland, you know, but particularly during the Clinton administration. Millions of people have been involved in and helped bring about the Irish peace process. But Dave's contribution to its survival can't be overlooked, especially given all the chance involved. What if Dave never went to Ireland on a fling in the first place? It's, it's hard to say. It's hard to say a, a what if in history, but they certainly would have presented a much more challenging and difficult problem uh, to the peace process, uh, to the British government in particular, uh, and of course also the Irish government too. Uh, there's no question about that. I'm not sure if it would have collapsed. It certainly would have went at different directions than it, than it did. It was Linda Vaughan who had introduced Dave to IRA types like Joe O'Neill in the first place. We were only able to speak to her friends and family because she died after a short battle with cancer in 2015. Her husband, Kevin Mangan. I think one of the saddest things and one of the reasons why I really wanted to do this was that her last trip over was 2005, uh, 2014. She went with her, her cousin, Pandy, and there was a rally, and Joe O'Neill was there. And she walked up to him and said, I don't know if you remember me, I'm Lena Vaughn. And he said, oh, indeed I do. You're the one who brought that traitor into our midst. For, for all of the good that she did and how hard she fought over there on the ground, that ultimately shouldn't be her legacy. Mangan said Linda refused to cooperate with the FBI years later when they showed up at their home. She never wanted to hurt her friends in the Republican cause. But bringing Dave into the fold, it did. Whether that's a good thing or a bad thing comes down to what you believe about what Dave did for Ireland. I see him as uh, enormously beneficial to peace in Northern Ireland. You know, the real IRA had zero support among the general public. And they killed 29, 31 people in a car bomb in Homa. And I think it would have gone on longer, was it not for uh, David Rupert putting Mickey McEvitt away. So I think the Irish public owed him a great deal of gratitude for everything he did. He put his life on the line. Now, you know, more cynically, you may say he got very well paid for doing it, but it's not everybody who can go to those kind of meetings not knowing if they're going to come out of them. You know what I mean? Like, particularly when they're like, oh, you know, come up the side of this mountain in darkness to a real IRA army council meeting. I mean, it, you know, it would have been a perfect place to kill him and have everybody seen again. Um, so I, I, I don't see him as, as a rat at all. I think, uh, I think he's been of great service to Ireland. While there aren't military checkpoints or regular bombings anymore, there is still a border between the North and South. Northern Ireland is a British province with nationalized health care and a British pension system. South of the border, the Republic is still part of the EU and plays host to a litany of major multinational corporations. Brexit threw a wrench into the status quo when the border between the North and South became the border between the UK 
and the European Union. There's not enough time for us to get into the nuances of this new issue here. But suffice to say, the idea of Irish unification is increasingly a conversation being had across the island. So we asked some of the people we interviewed about the possibility of a reunited Ireland. No, personally, I don't think so. I mean, I know I know that Sinn Féin certainly talk a lot about that. They talk about border polls. I just don't see it happening. I think I think uh, the the two communities are still have their own identities. The the Protestant community in Northern Ireland very much still sees itself as as part of a, the British community, although sometimes now they they refer to themselves as the Northern Irish to dif- separate them from the the rest of Ireland. Uh, and the Catholics in the in the in Northern Ireland, they still very much see themselves as Irish. Uh, they, they they don't refer to themselves as Northern Irish. I just don't think, though, that economically it would make sense for people in Northern Ireland to to be reunited in Ireland. And I don't. So I don't think they're going to vote for it in the near future. Uh, personally, I don't think I'll see it in my lifetime. But I'd love to see it, but I don't think it it will happen. I think it's very accurate. Brexit has to up a lot of complications for people. And yeah, I, I, I think also the threat of violence would dissuade some nationalists for voting for United Ireland, I think, because they know that the loyalists will probably start rearming if, there, if, if it was likely that there was going to be a vote north and south for the United Ireland. So yeah, it, it's, it's really hard to tell how that would go, actually. And also the Republic as well. I mean, the Republic is also going to have to vote for a United Ireland. You know, Dublin, Dublin is, well, Dublin is, is, is the tech capital of Europe and any sign of a resurgence of violence could lead to companies getting scared of settling in Ireland. Um, Sinn Féin are by far the largest party in Ireland. In fact, they have more votes now than the next two parties combined. And they obviously, you know, are the political wing of the now defunct provisional IRA. And they're very much pushing for this uh, referendum north and south that the other parties don't want. Uh, But if they get it, it's going to be very, very interesting to see what the reaction of the loyalist community would be if the picnic polls are showing that the majority north and south are in favor of unity. While nationalist paramilitary groups once caused violence to disrupt the status quo of a divided Ireland, one concern for a united Ireland is that loyalist paramilitary groups may return to violent resistance. Amid the troubles, Protestant loyalist terror groups set off bombs in Dublin while their rival, the IRA, attacked London. On one day in May 1974, Four bombs were set off in Dublin and Monaghan, killing 34 civilians. One thing is for sure, as much as we delved into this topic over the course of this show, there's still so much more to explore. It's a far-reaching conflict with deep roots. In the first episode, we interviewed Abden's mother about her family's IRA connections. Because part of the story is about Irish Americans and their connections to the conflict, for better or worse. So last summer, I interviewed a member of my family, my wife's Uncle Marty, whose father was an IRA member back in Ireland. My name is Martin Quinn. I'm 85 years old, the son of Harry O'Neill Quinn, who is no longer alive. He was from the old country. I was born here in the United States. My dad came over in 1928. Met my mom about 1930. My mom was born in uh, Bunny Cullum, County Mayo. My dad was born in Bambridge, County Down. If you walk into Bambridge, nothing but Union Jack signs all over, the flags and everything. I don't think he had a very good childhood there. And he got involved with the IRA there. My dad was uh, in the IRA until about, well, he was always in the area. He came over to this country. He had to come over because uh, he broke out of jail down there. 
in the, the raft room, the English room. Met my mother at the Bird Theater on Madison and Cicero. They had the Irish dancing. That's where he met her. He's what we call a lifer. He would have died for the IRA if he had the choice. I'm glad he didn't. And he would bring home his guys from the IRA. To my, my mom got scared. She said, Harry, I'm going back to the States to the boys. I don't care if you come or not. And so she, he left with her. Uncle Marty's dad returned to the U.S. and actually got a job with Frank O'Neill, the same one who Dave befriended. Uh, then he got a job with Frank O'Neill after the tobacco company. He retired out of the tobacco company. Went to work with Frank O'Neill. Oh, Frank O'Neill was a bartender. And he was just bartender. He owned the place. I used to go there every Friday night. Frank died in 2011 at 88 years old. He was remembered for founding several fundraising groups as well as championing the McBride principles in Illinois. After serving time back in Ireland in the 40s, he was never convicted on any charges here in the U.S. If you remember, one of Dave's conditions for testifying against McKevitt was that he would never be part of a case against Frank. Dave Rupert lived a strange double life in the 1990s. Well, I'd break that new to the wire back in there for Buckley, you know, it, the first thing to my mind was that we were going to line up further out here. It was a long, dangerous road that ultimately ended after the lengthy trial in 2003. When he negotiated his payment from the American and British governments, he knew he was going to be in for a difficult retirement and factored that in. I said, here's the deal. I was uh, 49 years old. I'd worked there as, uh, I left whether I worked uh, 40 or 3 while I worked more. And, you know, in a person's life from that period from 43 to 55, prime, I mean, I'm learning time. Yeah. The business that I left, the guy has continually made in two hundred thousand dollars a year, which was, you know, what the business was generating. Great. Dave says he had left a successful trucking business and entered into a career that ultimately, inevitably, became a dead end. Morning after the other day about, uh, you know, if we do this again. And I said that, you know, of course, oh yeah, I'd do it. Or I should get all nervous. And I said, no, I said, I didn't mean I'd do it again today. But given the set of pushing fans that existed at the time, I remember where we were at the time, I said, you know, and, and, you know, the downside of it always was, and, and we both knew that, you know, you get caught, you get dead, you know, for Aaron and, uh, uh, but you get dead doing a lot of other things, too. Dave told us he made the best decision with the information and circumstances he was in at the time. He said from that perspective, yeah, he would probably do it again if given the same circumstances and choices to make. There was one thing Dave told us over and over again. Dealing with the FBI, MI5, and even the Garda was a bear. And honestly, we kind of found the same thing in our research, both back then and over the past two years. Dave relayed stories in which all exhibited untrustworthiness, going back on their word, or doing things that needlessly put him in jeopardy. He also said they tried to screw him out of compensation, repeatedly. No matter how valuable and worthy the cause of peace, saving lives, the intel services often behave badly. Dave said his MI5 handler bragged, quote, we haven't lost a man yet, implying a level of safety that just wasn't true. In 2006, a few years after Dave's testimony, an MI5 informer named Dennis Donaldson was killed by the remnants of McKevitt's real IRA. I'm hoping, pray to God, he's living and he has a very peaceful life. You know, after all what he'd done, I'm sure even now, when he thinks back of some of the things he'd done and what could have went wrong or may have went wrong, but uh, in my opinion, he, he, he was extremely 
extremely brave and courageous. And if they're, I don't know what awards, I, I know that he has received an award from the FBI, but if there's an award for bravery within the United States, David Rupert is, a, is, is one person who definitely deserves that, definitely deserves it. So, yeah, he, he, he I mean, I have dealt over this past 24 years with a number of agents uh, and um, I value what they have done because every one of them has made a difference. From his childhood in upstate New York, Joby grew into Dave Rupert, a nearly seven foot tall, 300 pound guy who found a way to make a noise in his life. When I spoke to Scott Stevens about the people Dave called his Mohawk ancestors, he brought up one of the guiding principles of life in the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. It's a concept called Skano. When you say that you're in a state of Skano, of peace, we don't just mean absence of war or absence of violence, but it's much more like harmony. Are you at peace with your family? Are you at peace with your community? Are you at peace with your environment, the world you live in? Are you at peace with yourself? For those of us looking in from the outside, it's what we hope for Ireland. Balance, peace, harmony. Scano. Some parts still have a ways to go, with giant walls still snaking their way through the city of Belfast, dividing Catholic and Protestant communities. On a visit to Ireland about a decade ago, Uncle Marty stopped at one of those peace walls. Visitors are encouraged to write messages. Uncle Marty passed away a few months after we interviewed him. He was always a gentleman who lived Christian values. He left a simple message on the peace wall. Love each other as I have loved you. If you like this episode of The Rebel Kind, you could do us a favor by leaving a positive review on whatever hosting service you're listening to us on. The Rebel Kind is created and hosted by Bob Hergeth and Abdon Palish. Executive producer, Anjay Nagpal. Written by Dalton Main, Abdon Palish, and Bob Hergeth. Senior producer, Dalton Main. Editing and sound design by Gerard Bauer. Original music by Dale Eisinger. Show art by Rebecca Hendon. Our show was recorded in the podcast studio at Roosevelt University. The development producers were Danielle Elliott and Jen Swan. Marketing support from Tessa Karens Clay. Production legal by Bruns, Brennan, and Barry. Legal clearance fair use by Rachel Strom at Davis Wright Tremaine. From Entropy Media, the Underbelly series was created by Anjay Nagpal. Executive producer, Josh Fielstad. Executive producer, Gerard Bauer. Head of Operations is Nuna Ebo. Project Manager is Sebastian Perry. Associate Producer, Heidi Rudvotes. Development and Production Support, Simona Kessler. Special thanks to Flynn Roberts for calling us in 20 years ago. This series is dedicated to the innocent victims of Northern Ireland's decades of violence.